healthy business, both physically and emotionally. Vetsplaining is one veterinarian's attempt to explain and understand her own profession a little better. Join Dr. Lisa McFadden as she delves deep into the medical and business aspects of veterinary medicine. August is National Immunization Awareness Month. It's the annual observance sponsored by a committee under the Center for Disease Control, or the CDC. And it's technically meant to highlight the importance of vaccinations, also known as immunizations for people. But companion animals need vaccines too. So it's a great time for us to start talking about vaccines and our companion animals. Specifically, we're gonna focus on vaccinations for dogs and cats. And just a warning, vaccinations are a really comprehensive and complex topic. And you're gonna have a little bit of a long journey. Hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully it's a little bit fun ahead of you but I think it's worth it. And in an effort to avoid information overload, I've broken down this topic into three podcasts. So in this episode, we are gonna figure out the purpose of vaccines and discuss potential risks. So the first question is, what are vaccines? Vaccines are substances that are given to an individual that induce an immune response, and it prepares the immune system to fight a specific infectious disease. And the goal of a vaccine is to basically piss off or trigger the immune system to create antibodies to a particular disease. Vaccines use either non-infectious versions or little pieces of the infectious organism to trigger the response. And that way, when the individual is exposed to a disease for real, they either don't get sick or they get a really mild case and... That's because their body has an immune memory, aka antibodies, which fight the infection. Vaccinations over the last century in humans and animals have prevented death and disease in millions of individuals. The American Veterinary Medical Association lists five main reasons to vaccinate your companion animal. First, it prevents pet diseases. Second, prevention of the disease avoids the cost of treatment. Third, you prevent disease transmission from animal to animal and also, really importantly, animal to human. Fourth, rabies and distemper can occur in wildlife and can infect unvaccinated pets. Finally, all states have rabies vaccine requirements for companion canines and felines. That tells us what they are. The next question is, are they safe? And this is a seemingly benign question, but it's actually a lot trickier than you might initially think. The simple answer is yes, vaccines in general are very safe and effective. Unfortunately, like anything in medicine, vaccines are not 100% effective in preventing disease, but most are pretty darn close. And like any medication, vaccinations have potential side effects. The most common side effects, the most common side effects, which we also call adverse reactions, are mild and short term. And these can include pain at the injection site. And even though animal vaccines are usually given under the skin, not in the muscle, they can still cause local inflammation and irritation that can cause that area to be sore. And you have to keep in mind that animals react differently to painful stimuli when you compare them to people. Uh, in part because they can't talk. And sometimes it's similar to how an infant will react to a painful stimuli. So in pets, you can see anything from vocalization, like yelping, crying, whining, to increased panting. They can hide. They might start shaking and trembling. Sometimes they just look really sad and pathetic. Pain can present itself in all of those varieties. And so sometimes it can be really hard for an owner to realize that it's actually injection site pain so it's really important for veterinarians to talk about that so that owners can recognize it and let you know if they see it other common mild adverse reactions include lethargy which we usually recognize as them being really sleepy depression so they just don't really seem like they have a pep in their step vomiting and diarrhea usually these signs occur within the first 1 to 12 hours after the vaccine and they can last for up to 24 hours immediate but very uncommon side effects are more like anaphylactic reactions which can be emergency situations and require immediate veterinary care signs of serious allergic reactions include facial swelling hives severe lethargy like they can almost be non-responsive or comatose heavy labored breathing or short rapid shallow breath collapse and severe shivering trembling If these signs are seen, then the pet should be taken to the closest veterinarian for immediate assessment. I usually tell my clients, if all of a sudden your border collie looks like a Sharpay, bring him back. And if it's a true anaphylactic or severe allergic reaction, then the pet is generally given injectable Benadryl and a short-acting steroid. Sometimes patients need to be hospitalized for a few hours, potentially on IV fluids, especially if their blood pressure has dropped in response uh, to the anaphylactic reaction. Keep in mind, 
these adverse reactions are really uncommon, are self-limiting and require no veterinary attention. If animals, especially tiny or small breed puppies, are painful after the injection, then they can be given a couple of days of an anti-inflammatory. We commonly call them NSAIDs, which stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And we want to use special veterinary NSAIDs because most of the human anti-inflammatories like Advil, Motrin, Tylenol can be toxic to pets. And just as an aside, a lot of times people want to give their pets aspirin. Don't give your pet aspirin unless your veterinarian recommends it. They've done studies that show that 80% of pets that receive one dose of aspirin will have some form of microscopic intestinal bleed. So it's really irritating to their GI tract and we have to dose it really carefully. So even if you have nothing to give, don't give aspirin. We used to recommend aspirin a lot, but not anymore. Back to the topic at hand. Rarely patients can experience what's called a delayed adverse reaction to the vaccines. So sometimes they can have immune-mediated diseases that develop as a response to the vaccine. Examples would include anemia or the development of low platelets. Your platelets are kind of your first line of defense when you are clotting. So if you cut yourself and you start to bleed and it clots right away, those are your platelets that start that. And this response is basically an exaggerated immune response that's triggered by the vaccine. Remember, the goal of the vaccine is to piss off the immune system, and sometimes it does it too well. And if the patient has the right genetics or epigenetics, which is basically your genetics that are then affected by your environment, you know, nature, nurture, then that can allow for an inappropriate or excessive immune response so that then the, Im uh, the immune system is initially doing its job, right? It's responding to the vaccine, but then it's kind of like a response to the vaccine, and it's so jazz, it's so hyper, it's like the immune system drank a whole bunch of coffee, that then it starts saying, oh, I can respond to anything. And so it starts attacking the body. And the examples that I gave before, if it starts attacking the red cells, that can cause anemia. If it starts attacking the platelets, that can affect your clotting. And these delayed vaccine reactions are generally not seen until about two to four weeks post-vaccine. And the reason for this is it takes the immune system about two weeks to fully respond to the vaccine. If you remember back to your high school days and they would talk about bell curves, you know, like most people get Bs and then some people get As, some people get Cs. Well, a bell curve is really the image that we want when we think about the immune response. So it starts off slow, peaks, and then dips back down. And it takes two full weeks for that whole cycle to occur. And occasionally patients can develop a small lump at the injection site. In thin patients, a lump can be seen immediately after you give the vaccine and it's just this little bleb under the skin. That's not the same thing as what we're going to talk about. That's just literally the physical fluid under the skin. They're just thin or they're a puppy and you can see it really well. And that fluid usually absorbs and goes away within 12 hours. But sometimes as the body is responding to the vaccine, it creates a local reaction at the site where the vaccine is given and that can cause swelling underneath the skin that can develop a few days post vaccine. These swellings are generally non-painful. They usually go away within a month of appearance. But if your pet ever develops an injection site lump, you should always take them to your veterinarian so that they can check it, make sure that's what it is, and monitor it. And if the lump does not go away within a month, then I always recommend that we surgically remove them just to prevent that inflammatory lesion from potentially becoming something else. And cells can go from being inflamed to having what's called metaplasia, which is basically like precancerous changes to cancer. And again, that's really, really rare. And I've only had one case where I've actually had to recommend they surgically remove it, but it's still something that we want to monitor. Cats because they're mostly alien and do whatever they want, can actually develop months to years later a tumor at that injection site. And that's most commonly what we call a vaccine sarcoma. And these are really nasty buggers. They're locally aggressive. They can sometimes even require a limb amputation depending on where the vaccine was given, how invasive, how big. And we suspected that some of the additives that we used to use in the feline vaccines contributed to the development of these tumors. These additives are referred to as adjuvants. And an adjuvant is a substance that's deliberately put into the vaccine to irritate the immune system, to cause a bigger response because the bigger the response the better the antibody production is the theory and so we were concerned that putting these additives into the vaccines in certain cases i.e some cats we actually were seeing the development of vaccine sarcomas 
And it's not to say that vaccines cause cancer or adjuvants cause cancer. It's just in certain cats with the right genes and the right environmental exposure, you could see that injection site irritation cause cells to change, what we think of as metaplasia, and then go on to continue changing and become cancerous cells. A lot of people, just to be safe, myself included, just try and not use adjuvants in cat vaccines just because even if that's not the only thing that causes injection site sarcomas, it, it's at least one less thing you have to think about. And there are some veterinary oncologists and immunologists that believe that really any injection in a cat can potentially cause a sarcoma, but there just hasn't been enough studies for us to say, yes, anything can potentially cause it. A lot of veterinary medicine is practicing so you can sleep at night, so I can sleep knowing that I don't use adjuvants in my feline vaccine. Another thing veterinarians do is they give the vaccine as low on the limb as possible, and that way, if a sarcoma were to develop anyway, and the limb would need to be amputated, at least when you remove the limb, you remove the entire tumor. But if you give it up by the hip, even if you amputate the leg, a lot of times it's still already spread up into the tissue over the lower back. Giving it as low on the limb really helps us kind of just ensure that even if something happens, this cat would still have the best possible outcome. This leads to a little bit of a tangent about vaccine administration. And I subscribe to the theory that injectable vaccines should always be given under the skin, on a limb, and never between the shoulder blades. And the reason I say this is if you give it on a limb, then you're relying on the local lymph node to help with the immune response. That way, each lymph node can respond to each individual vaccine. If I give multiple vaccines, then I give one in each limb. And that way, I can get that local immune response from that lymph node, and then ultimately the whole immune system will respond to the vaccine. The last reason is there's an issue with that specific vaccine. You know which one it was because in your medical record, you've labeled for instance, I gave the rabies in the right rear, I gave the lepto in the left front, and then if your patient comes back and they have a little lump on the left rear, well then you know, hey, that's the rabies vaccine. A lot of veterinarians give the same vaccines in the same limbs, which is fine. I, at my clinic, personally don't care where I give it, my doctors give it, or the technicians give it, as long as it's on a limb and it's written down. That way, nobody has to remember like, oh, I have to give distemper in the left rear. It's just we know it's in the record, so if there's ever a question, we can find the answer. Another theory that I have, that this is totally unproven, and but the nice thing is like, there's no way to prove it, so you can't say it's a bad theory. Uh, that's the beauty of uh, improvable theories, right? If you give the vaccine in the back leg, it causes less discomfort. And the reason I think that is, so the nerves that go from your brain to your back legs are much longer, right? Because there's like, it's one nerve from your brain to through your spinal cord and then it then exits the spinal cord where it then hooks up with other nerves. And so if you give it farther away, it takes longer for that impulse to get to your brain, so it should be less painful, whereas if you give it in the front limb, it's a shorter distance, so it might be more painful. Kind of like if you, you know, smash your thumb versus smash your, your toe, your thumb's going to throb more than your toe. Again, you can't prove it. I just, it makes me feel, as another aside, since we are living in tangent land now in my podcast, I prefer to give less vaccines at each visit. So I would rather give one to two vaccines at each visit and give them over multiple visits than I would to give them all at once. If you give less vaccines, then you have a decreased risk of an immediate vaccine reaction. You also know what the reaction is to if you're giving less vaccines. And this is especially true in puppies and kittens. So I ideally like to limit it to one vaccine if they're really small. If they're a huge dog, then two vaccines is fine. But this requires the client to come back more often. And so your clients have to be on board for this and they have to understand why you're doing it. You're not doing it just to keep making them come back in and you're not doing it to make more money because you're not charging them an exam every time. In fact, if I give them an exam at a wellness visit and then I say, I'd like to split up your vaccines, come back in three weeks. That appointment is then set up with a technician. So the, the only charge is for the cost of the vaccine, which would be the same if I gave it or my technician gave it. We generally advise waiting at least two weeks between vaccines, again, to allow that immune system the two full weeks to respond to the vaccine before we show it another stimulus. They've actually shown that vaccines that are given closer to, than two weeks apart can confuse the immune system and it can actually reduce the chance that your immune system is going to respond well to each vaccine. And this is really important when you're talking about puppy and kitten vaccine series, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about later. 
going back to the topic we were talking about, vaccine safety, we know that there's potential negatives and every patient should be evaluated as an individual and 